Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe here from East Macau, Stan. Hello and greetings. And we are back with another Silmarillion podcast video after a long hiatus from this podcast. We are going to be discussing the chapter of, of men. Manly men. No, this is long before the tights were invented. At least for mortal men doomed to die. They were, however, already invented for elves and Valar. So they had to suffer already. The Valar would sit amongst their mountains over in Amman with little disturbance to their peace. So that the lordship of Morgoth, as it is written in the Silmarillion, was uncontested, save by the valor of the Noldor. Only Ulmo kind of kept track of things and gathered news throughout the earth, through all of his waters, worried for the Noldor and how they had bitten off more than they could chew. It was at the first rising of the sun that the younger children of the Luvatar, as it is said in the Silmarillion, awoke. They were in the land of Hildorian to the east of Middle-earth, and when the first sunrise took place, eyes of men opened and turned towards it. They began to wander in that direction. They were also called Atani by the Eldar, the second people. They were also called the Hildor, the followers, which that feels a bit like a slur. Men are tribal people by nature. While the elves had their tribes, they don't seem to have been particularly prone to being followers. With their fall, they were pretty hot-headed. And that said, there were other names, such as Apanonar, the Afterborn, Angwar, which is the Sickly. There is Firimar, the Mortals. Now, by the Third Age, the Elves have warmed up to mortal men, as seen when Thranduil is keen to provide assistance to the people of Lake Town and of the Dale. Given how Elrond was happy to raise Aragorn as though he were his own, the relationship obviously changed over time. And they named mortal men also the Usurpers. That's not very respectful. Strangers, which... Yeah. Okay. The inscrutable, because who could guess what men are going to do next? And the self-cursed. Like, well, your curse is your own fault. Hmm. I doubt there's many men who appreciated that. You then have the heavy-handed. Yeah, this coming from the Noldor and the elves. Yeah, seriously, they're going to accuse us of being heavy-handed? That seems a little haughty. The night fearers. That's fair. I just say that's fair because, as it's been said in Hercules Legendary Journeys at one point, we all fear the night in our own way. And this is an important theme in a lot of stories. And let's be honest, men do fear the dark deep down because of what they associate with the dark. Because it's not really an external thing that they're looking at. It's an internal thing. And there is also the children of the sun. It's probably a nod to how mortal men first opened their eyes and saw the sun. The story becomes a little foggy as it is written that there is little, almost nothing to speak of of the elder days as it pertains to men. Now they awoke in the second spring of Arda. At this time, the Eldar were pretty much at their peak. The only ones who are spoken of are of the fathers of men, the Atanatari, and they were in the first years of the sun and moon, the ones who wandered into the north of the world and then west. Now, the Valar did not end up arriving to guide men, nor did they summon them to dwell in Valinor. It's written that men typically have feared the Valar rather than loved them, have rarely, if ever, understood the purposes of the powers, and being at variance with them, They've struggled with the divine, which is very true. There's a bit of a commentary on our species, I think, there by Tolkien. A not-so-subtle one. It's merited. It has to be noted that in the Unfinished or the Lost Tales, tales you had an early set of wars. Men were guided away from Eru Iluvatar. Iluvatar early on came to men and was doting on them, but when he went away for a time... Morgoth hurried along and told the people to turn away from Eru and offered gifts and whatnot and convinced the people to worship him. He then began to encourage the fathers of men to commit sins and compete with each other, to do terrible, unspeakable things, which they did. Eru was very saddened by this and condemned men to no longer be immortal. There now being a war of beasts and men corrupted by Morgoth, or sort of, more corrupted by their own vices, turning on those who, realizing their error, sought to repent. 
the war was really led, at least I think in the Lost Tales, by Fankill, another one of Morgoth's viceroys, who saw men pushed westwards. Men were to flee west. And these were the men who ended up being the ancestors to Beor, for example, and Hala. And they arrived in the west after years of wanderings. And when they finally arrived west, they were met with the Eldar. The sad thing is they, were, they wished to flee the darkness and find their way towards the light, only to find Morgoth in the west when they had tried to, to flee from him. So it's a rather tragic fate that they were trying to give their children a better future. They were fleeing from evil only to find the king of evil off in the West. They were manipulated in that regard by Morgoth. But that seems cruel. But that's Morgoth. Yeah, very true. Very true. That said, it is then that they realized they could not run away from the dark forever. So they decided to stand and fight. These men of the West were to fight to the death for generations in a almost futile struggle against Morgoth. In this regard, the story becomes rather akin to World War I in some ways, and you can see some of the experiences seeping into certain parts of the story, and some of the view of we fight for our future generations so that they won't have to suffer as we did mentality that was pretty prevalent in The Greatest Generation, which, sadly, it was even prevalent to an extent in the Napoleonic Generation. Funny how you can't ever fully banish evil, but that does not diminish the sacrifices of those who came before, because it makes it all the more beautiful in some ways. I think that Tolkien was speaking to regarding these ancient Atanatari, these fathers of men, who were truly wondrous and great and trying to do the right thing for future generations. They were also still being chased from the East, as there were tribes that gave chase that were corrupted by Morgoth. These we'll call the Easterlings. They gave chase and were savage and cruel and are rather in some ways akin to Howard's Hyrcanians. Except where in Howard's lore, the sad thing is that the men of the Easterlings of his universe, in some cases, are can be really good people. But the sad thing for them was that they were originally the Lemurians who were fleeing the destruction of their isles, only to arrive ashore and to be enslaved for generations in cruel conditions by a non-human race. Then they rose up to destroy their oppressors. Easterlings of Tolkien's literature seem to be very similar in that regard. They were victims, in a way, of Morgoth's cruelties and they forgot this was not what they were meant to be and so they sank deeper into darkness there is a certain degree of confusion amongst the eldar regarding where humans go as they don't think they go to the halls of mandos on the other hand baron son of barahir was the only one to ever return from the halls of mandos elves are destined to wane and fade away while men usurp the sunlight so to speak. I kind of wonder if, to an extent, if that's to be the fate of men in the latter days, so to speak, of Arda themselves. It is commented that, in time, there'd be an offspring of Elf and Mortal in the form of Eärendil and Elwing, as well as Elrond, their child. The Elves not exactly having a great time of it in Middle-earth, but it's what happens. Next Silmarillion video will be an exciting return to the Feanorians, and all about how the Noldor returned to Arda and what that means for Thingol and the others who are in Arda. At present, when the Noldor arrive, you have men pretty much beginning their journey west. They're being pushed westwards by Fankill, as Morgoth had to did go east, but then had to come back west because, you know, he's got Dark Lord stuff to do. Executions, defiling the face of Middle-earth, preparing for war against the Noldor, and birthday parties. I mean, come on. He's got to think of a good gift to get Sauron. Let's not forget handing things like Fifty Shades of Grey to uh, the people. Oh yes, defiling the human race with Fifty Shades of Grey. That is his greatest crime. That in Twilight. Oh, definitely. But anyways, jokes aside, what was your thoughts of this page and a half of a chapter? It is quite a philosophical chapter because you see the effects of religion and lack of religion. Men, here it is, when they worship the Eru Iluvatar, they were prosperous. But the moment they turned away from him, look at what happened. It's more reminiscent to an extent of something that Christopher Lee once said, is that if you devote yourself to the occult, you will effectively lose your mind over time. That you kind of see that philosophical battle between 
the worshippers of Iluvatar and the worshippers of Morgoth. And then there's the entire matter of, is a curse really a curse or is it a blessing? And is a blessing truly a blessing or is it a curse? And okay, th that's a complicated question. The idea of death is called the gift of Iluvatar, at what life is. It's been said that life is passion and suffering, that these are the two constants of the human experience and of life itself. Looking at it that way, you're always passionate about something and you're also always suffering in some capacity, almost undeniable as a part of the human experience. If you could live forever, you'd basically be suffering forever and tormented by your passions forever, whether it's love or hatred. But then inevitably there will be a lot of suffering. That's really what I kind of wonder with the elves. Is it really a prize? Because you look at Feanor, it wasn't exactly a fun experience for him, living forever, I mean. You even look at Maethros. He goes from at least being somewhat happy to swearing an oath he shouldn't have, and then losing everything he loved, destroying all that remained of that he could love in his life almost. Like, he basically becomes a tool of Morgoth in a way. He becomes dishonored. This might sound weird, but if immortality was a real thing, I think it'd be inevitable that an immortal would commit suicide. They would be driven insane by life. And I know that's a weird thought, but it's just, you look at the elves, even in the Third Age, Galadriel and Elrond and Celeborn are all exhausted emotionally. They just want to journey west and go back to Valinor and pass away for all intents and purposes. Whereas human experience is a short one, it's vivid, it burns bright, it can be beautiful as well as horrid in equal measures. What you're looking at is an experience that it can be a curse, but it can also be a blessing. And there is a curse within the blessing and a blessing within the curse, so to speak. Because philosophically, the blessing is being able to go to the halls of Mandos and then being part of the second music of the Ainur. On the other hand, the curse is a short life in comparison to the Eldar. On the other hand, having to suffer under the thrall of Morgoth or otherwise suffer a horrendous fate as most do in the legendarium there is a curse to life to an extent but there's also a blessing to it everything is mixed I think the idea is supposed to be like what you do with your life and your death is what counts in that there should be a touch of northern courage in you or at least that's the idea of humanity in a way at least in the Silmarillion that they're always charging ahead and this is why they're so inscrutable to the elves because there's a curse mixed with the blessing they have to make every moment and every second of both life and death count. On the other hand, in death, elves are mortal and humans are mortal. In life, elves are immortal and humans are mortal. This is a very philosophical and almost theological. With a lot of commentary. A lot of commentary that can be related to the real world. And it's a fascinating, fascinating chapter. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button as though you were Morgoth crushing Fingolfin with Gron.